of the most controversial incidents in Jesus' life is when he was baptized and in particular the role played by John the Baptist. I believe that John is absolutely crucial to the story of Jesus and how he begins his messianic mission to change the world. And there is strong evidence to suggest that John and Jesus not only worked together, they were also related. People often don't think about this, but Jesus and John the Baptist are very close. They're part of the same family. It has to do with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. In the Gospels, you've got a word in Greek, sungenes, which means a kin person. It could be cousin, it could be aunt, but it's clearly part of the same extended family. But as with the rest of Jesus' blood family, the Bible writers have done their best to downgrade John's real status. If anyone shoots, uh, you just hide behind the vehicles or any other thing you can find. Thank you. Okay, I'll do that. Today, the site of Jesus' baptism is a closed-off military zone on the River Jordan, and you need special permission to visit it. The idea of Jesus having a real blood family was too dangerous for the early church fathers, as it challenged his divine status. So they simply remove them from the story. I think what happens with the family in general is once you exalt Jesus and Mary to such a heavenly position so that they're barely human, if human at all, then there's this tendency not only to lose sight of the others, but to even deny their importance. Oh, wow. But I believe that as well as Joseph and Mary, Jesus had four brothers, two sisters, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, and at least one cousin. John's mentioned, but only to point to the main guy. You picture John as pointing to Jesus, when in fact he was the inaugurator. He, he was the one who instituted the movement that Jesus joined. Amazingly, in the Bible, there is a crucial passage in the Gospel of Luke in which Jesus talks to a crowd of people and acknowledges John's key role. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. Now, there's no one except Moses that's ever called more than a prophet in the Bible. Being a prophet is very great. So, in effect, Jesus is saying, yeah, he's a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. He said he's the messenger that was promised that is coming uh, to prepare the way of the Lord. Later, in the very same passage, Jesus emphasizes John's importance even further. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. But this idea that John could be greater than Jesus was just too dangerous for the editors of the Bible. So an extra phrase was later added to put John down. A phrase that didn't exist in the earliest source of this saying. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. A pious editor quickly adds, as a kind of a gloss, but the least in the kingdom is greater than John. And I really doubt if Jesus said that. Jesus being baptized by John is actually putting himself in a kind of disciple relationship with John. And I know that's shocking to people because they immediately think, oh, no, no, it's the other way around. But when Jesus is asked about John, he says that. He says that very thing. The true nature of this relationship between John and Jesus has been an acute embarrassment to the church for the last 2,000 years. Father Aliata is an expert on John's traditional story. It is, it is not uh, clear, I think, that Jesus was a disciple of John the Baptist. It, it doesn't appear nowhere. But in the book of John, the first chapter, there's a big debate about who is the Messiah. Is it John or is it Jesus? Who's sent from God? 
Why were people discussing that after the death of Jesus? Why was it such a big issue? Yes, because uh, certainly John the Baptist was a very, very important prophet. Um, Jesus himself says uh, it is uh, the um, more important person of the old uh, alliance, but uh, the uh, smallest in the new uh, covenant is uh, greater than uh, John the Baptist. So it is a very important person, but more important is, is the new thing that Jesus is uh, giving to the, to the world now. For most Christians today, the idea that John the Baptist was Jesus' rabbi, his teacher, is still inconceivable. But right at the heart of Christianity is something that disproves this, the origins of our most famous prayer. Okay. Now there's one thing they share that is very, very interesting, and this is the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. The Our Father, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth, give us this day our daily bread. This is the signature prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. The Gospel of Luke introduces the Lord's Prayer with Jesus' disciples asking him to teach them to pray as John had done. Now it's usually understood to mean John taught his disciples to pray, so teach us to pray, maybe like a different prayer. But if you look at the Greek, it can very well imply teach us that prayer that John taught his disciples. And I think if you look at the elements of the prayer, you can make a very good case that Jesus and John both share this prayer as kind of, I would call it, the core of their message. So maybe John first came up with that prayer. Just a few miles from John's traditional home, there is new physical evidence of the importance of his role in Jesus' life story. In 1999, while conducting a routine archaeological survey, Dr. Shimon Gibson found the opening to an ancient cave. So, this is the cave of John the Baptist. Wow, please come in. The cave contains archaeological evidence that it was used for ritual baptism during the time of Jesus and John. What leads you to believe that this is the cave of John the Baptist? Well, you can see very faint scratchings in the walls. In fact, these are deeply incised uh, drawings. Um, you can see the figure of John the Baptist and he's got upraised arms and he's got the hairy garment which is referred to in the Gospels. That's quite uh, clearly depicted. Then on the other side you have the head of uh, John the Baptist over here. This actually would then uh, relate to the decapitation, the death of uh, John the Baptist. So in a way with this uh, symbol you have the end of the story of, of John the Baptist in the Gospels. Can you describe what would have taken place here in the time of John the Baptist? Well, uh, based on archaeological evidences, I would say that people came through this very large doorway, they walked down a couple of steps, and then they had this kind of earthen embankment. In a way, it was like a, a bank of a river. And then they would descend into the water itself, and there they could be baptized. They could simply immerse themselves in water. And I'd like to show you something really interesting. If you come up over here, you'll see that in, on the top of this stone, this is a, a replica jug which we placed here. But on top of the stone is this groove here. And this groove is the, in the shape of a right foot, and it's for the placing of the right foot inside. And then a person would take the jug and then pour over the foot, the, the, the oil, and anoint the foot. Do you feel that there's been an attempt to downplay the role of John and John's work as a baptizer in the New Testament? Clearly, the, those uh, who are dealing with the writing of uh, uh, the, the Gospels are interested in the Jesus story. That's their goal. And they're only interested in, in John the Baptist insofar as it helps along the story. And of course, uh, there are certain sort of elements there that they want to downplay in order to uh, show that uh, Jesus is the, the prominent figure and that John the Baptist is the precursor, the one who is uh, uh, waiting there in the wings preparing everything for the time that uh, uh, Jesus will, will arrive. 
But that there is an interesting relationship between uh, John and, and uh, Jesus, and really the career of Jesus only um, blooms, if I may put it that way, after the death of uh, John the Baptist, that um, John the Baptist is clearly in command up to that point. But the Bible editors felt otherwise, and wherever possible, they tried to write John out of the story. This process is most blatant in the biblical accounts of Jesus' baptism. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. We take the earliest gospel, Mark, and we simply have the recorded fact that Jesus went down to the Jordan and was baptized by John, and he too got the calling, and uh, that's simply all that is said. In the next gospel, the story is already beginning to change. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Although it mentions John baptizing Jesus here in the Jordan River, John is said to protest that he is not worthy of such a task. And then you get Luke, which is the third in line, and what does he do? He doesn't even mention that John baptized Jesus. It's very subtle. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens open. And you think, well, huh, wonder who baptized him. Hi. And then you get to the fourth stage, which is the latest, Gospel of John, and there's no baptism mentioned at all. Where John baptized Jesus? Yes, here. This side. The standard way of looking at it is Jesus is the main character and he goes out to meet John and John simply introduces him almost like on the side of a stage. He says, here's Jesus, and then he walks off. But if you understand it in its context, it's actually flipped around. It's the opposite. John is the prophet. In fact, Jesus said, you think he's a prophet? He's more than a prophet. So who was greater, Jesus or John? They were the same. Yes. You think they were the same? They were both, both prophets. Jesus couldn't be greater than John. Well, uh, I, for me, it's the same. For you, it's the same. Yeah. Ever since Jesus was declared God, the church has struggled with the balance between his divine and human natures. And it is the divine that has won out. The losers were John the Baptist and the rest of his blood family. Tony Blair. Tony Blair. The son here. He, his son was baptized here? Yeah. Yes, here. Yeah, oh, that's good. That's good. He needs all the help he can get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you take care. In the next part, I reveal that in one of the greatest scandals in Christian history, the role of another of Jesus' blood family, the first Christian bishop, his eldest brother James, has been written out of the Christian story. In traditional Christmas scenes all over the world, the Holy Family is always depicted as just three people, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. But deep in the Judean desert, there is an ancient monastery that has a very unusual icon that includes a mysterious fourth member of the Holy Family. Hello. Hello, are you the priest? I'm looking for some pictures that you have of the Holy Family's flight into Egypt. For the last 2,000 years, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches have done their best to hide a scandal at the heart of the Christian story. It concerns Jesus' blood family, and in particular, the role of his eldest brother, James. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Who is there? Who, who are the people there? Maria. Mary, yeah. Mary. Jesus, Christos. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Joseph, Jacob. Or James. James. So, who is James? Adelphos to Christu. Adelphos to He's like the brother, like the brother of Jesus. 
like his brother, but he's not his brother. Seems to me that this is very, it's very confusing. May I believe that you to Joseph? Ah, sorry. Uh, Joseph, mm -hmm. father uh, Jacob. Yes. Jacob. Okay, so Joseph is the father of James, yeah. but Mary is not the mother of James. Mary, she's the mother, mother of Jesus. Jesus. Right, okay, okay. You're saying that James is the son of Joseph, um, but Mary is not his mother. But it's still fascinating because it's a picture of the Holy Family and there are four of them. Despite the church's best efforts to deny his blood relationship to Jesus, I believe James is one of the most important figures in early Christianity, at least as significant as its traditional founders, Peter and Paul. Paul refers to James as the first of the three figures he calls the pillars of the Jerusalem church, James, Peter and John. He puts James first, even before Peter, in that context. Um, I think if you look hard at the New Testament, you can see that James really was as important a figure as Peter and Paul. Hidden away in Jerusalem is an Armenian cathedral dedicated to the memory of Jesus' brother James. It is supposed to be built on the site of his tomb. When Jesus died, his new movement needed a successor to take over. The non-biblical historical sources are almost unanimous as to the identity of this new leader. The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you are going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Jesus replied to them, No matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. They chose James the Just as overseer of Jerusalem. James the Just is recorded to have been the first elected to the throne of the oversight of the church in the Jerusalem. The succession of the church passed to James, the brother of the Lord. But when it comes to the Bible, you have to look very hard to uncover the truth about James's role as the first leader of Jesus' new movement. The writing of James out of Christian history uh, takes centuries, but it starts early. Where we first see it very clearly is uh, in the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. Mark had mentioned the brothers of Jesus and even named them. Luke comes along, he's got Mark as a source, and he comes to the passage where Mark mentions the brothers and he just deep sixes it. It's gone. It's not there. Now he gets to the story of the early movement after the death of Jesus, book of Acts got 28 chapters. By chapter 9, it's all Paul. Now, in those first chapters, James is mentioned a couple of times, and it's even acknowledged that he's the leader. But it's almost a grudging admission. Oh yes, there was this guy, James. He was in charge. But Paul came along, and that's who we're really interested in. That's the beginning of the story of the writing out of James, I think, from history is the New Testament itself, writes him out. But there were certain events in James's life even the Bible writers could not ignore. Twenty years after Jesus' death, the new movement faced a major crisis over its future. The question was, how strictly Jewish should it remain? All the church leaders were called to Jerusalem to decide the question. One man took the final decision. This whole thing came to a head in the Council of Jerusalem. The issue is settled by James. James has the last word. And it's James who provides a scriptural argument from the Old Testament that the Messianic people of God will include Gentiles as Gentiles, not having to become Jews. James is responsible for that. Without James, that may have continued to be a huge rift, a huge debate in the Christian church. James settles it, it's scarcely ever debated again. The followers of Jesus' new movement had a stark choice between two versions of Christianity, one based on the visions of Paul, a man who had never met Jesus, and the other, the original Jewish form, championed by James and the family of Jesus. 
problem was that as more and more non-Jewish people converted to Christianity, the more marginalized James's Jewish Christians became. Evidence of Christianity's Jewish origins can be found on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, where there is an ancient cemetery containing the remains of thousands of religious Jews. In 1953, during routine building work, a huge complex of graves was revealed, dating back to the first century. There was even speculation they could contain the bones of some members of the very early church. This was an incredible discovery, an ancient tomb on the Mount of Olives containing hundreds of ossuaries, bone boxes. They also found inscriptions of ancient biblical names, names like Simon, Martha, Mary, Joseph, and even Jesus. Some of these could have been members of the first Jewish Christian community here in Jerusalem, led by James. But the important thing to remember is that they're buried here as Jews, not as Christians. Some of the bone boxes have crosses engraved on them. One theory is that later Christians carved them in an attempt to Christianize their Jewish occupants. Judaism became very unpopular after the Great Roman War. There was a tax put on Jews, and for someone to say, I'm Jewish, did not necessarily draw a favorable response. Oh, you're one of those hidden enemies of the emperor and of the empire. And the church disassociated itself from the Jews. If you'd ask James, what are you? He would say, I'm a Jew. I follow the God of Abraham, and I follow the leadership of my teacher, my brother, Jesus. If you go forward a couple hundred years and say, what are you? I'm a Christian who believes in the heavenly Jesus Christ, Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and there's no family. The family's lost, forgotten, blotted out, totally irrelevant to this, I would call it new religion. One event proved catastrophic for James and the Jewish Christians' control of the early church. In AD 70, after a bloody revolt, the Romans captured Jerusalem and destroyed the focus of their faith, the great Jewish temple. For the last 30 years, Israeli archaeologist Professor Ronnie Reich has been investigating this calamitous event. The destruction of the temple for Jews would be like the equivalent of Mecca being destroyed for Muslims and the, the central focal point just being wiped out. Yes, yes, exactly. This would be a total catastrophe. End of the world, as we would say, for that people. For those who were slain, we have the description of uh, Flavius Josephus in his book uh, on the history of the Jewish war against uh, Rome. He tells us that the Romans entered to the, to the residential part of Jerusalem he says rivers of blood were uh, extinguishing the, the fire, the flames. So much blood was there. We found in one house, we call it the burnt house, uh, the bones of an arm of a young girl, about 25 years old, only the arm up to the elbow, cut at the elbow. Mm. And this, of course, uh, uh, depicts the drama very vividly. Somebody cut it off and the rest of her body was not found in, in the vicinity. So in the same way that when the temple is destroyed, Judaism is destroyed, and has to reconstitute itself, we could say that these Jewish Christians who are around, there's also a shift in power. They then have to rethink the focus of their faith and what they do next because there is no temple. Well, uh, those who were facing the Romans as soldiers, etc., were slain. Others fled to the desert and the rest were taken as captives to Rome. The destruction of the temple and Jerusalem dealt a body blow to the Jesus family's control over the new Christian movement. In one fell stroke, they lost their headquarters and the focal point of their faith. The initiative was now handed to the followers of their arch-rival Paul. And the center of operations moved from the small country of Palestine to the center of the known world the capital of the Roman Empire.